So hello everybody and welcome to this second session in the series on the case for English. I'll, I'll be sort of swiveling my head back and forth. So you might see the back of my head for some of this. Um, apologies. Um, my name is Eliane Glazer and I'm a research fellow here at the Institute for English Studies. Um, and I, I used to write academically, I now write non-academic books, so, and I'm, I'm a radio producer, so I, I suppose I'm on the boundary between English as an academic subject and the outside world, so I suppose I envisage these events as existing partly on that boundary to look at um, the case for English as it's articulated within the academy, but also looking at how English as a subject is viewed out from outside the, the academy. So thinking about how to best make that case um, uh, on both sides of that line, as it were. Um, and I also, I suppose my aim for this series is to bring together some of the, um, the best and the latest thinking on the case for English. Um, obviously we're all familiar with the difficult context for English as a subject, um, but also you know, there's, we've talked um, perhaps in the, last, uh, but in the last session about how which is about the value of criticism, about how, in a way, that um, the sense of crisis is a self-perpetuating um, uh, circle. So actually, this is about making a positive case for English um, rather than a, a defence, perhaps. Um, so looking for, for strategies, argumentative strategies, resources that we can pull together um, to, to best make the case for English. Um, and I'll be writing a report at the end of the series. So um, I'm trying to pull together resources, so reading materials, um, links, um, institutions. So please email me, eliane.glazer at sas.ac.uk with ideas of things that you'd like me to add to that. And that report will be on the IES website in due course. So I'm very happy to welcome today um, five excellent speakers. Um, Dinah Burt here is Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Liverpool, and she's written several books on Victorian literature. Isabel Armstrong um, is Emeritus Professor of English at Birkbeck and is a Senior Research Fellow here at the IES and also author of many books on Victorian literature and culture. Susan Elderkin um, is a pioneer in the field of bibliotherapy at the School of Life and elsewhere and is also a critic, a teacher of creative writing, and an award-winning novelist. And John Shad um, is Professor of Modern Literature at the University of Lancaster, and he's written many books on Victorian culture also, and on modernism, post-criticism, and creative critical writing. And his own work sits in that space between the critical and the creative. Um, and Helen Small here is Merton Professor of English at the University of Oxford. She's the author of the key text, The Value of the Humanities, which tests the main arguments in favor of the humanities that are made um, currently. And she's also written on cynicism, aging, and Victorian literature. And I'm also very happy to see in the audience um, Nicholas Gaskell and Rowan MacDonald, who um, spoke at the last session on the value of criticism. Um, and perhaps there are other people who I can't see on the screen um, that are joining us again. So thank you all for being here. So each of our speakers will give a short presentation um, and that will be followed by discussion. So please do store up your questions and also your comments um, for after the, the presentations. And we're going to start with Dinah Birch. Thank you, Marianne. Um, hello, everyone. Very good to be here this afternoon. Uh, five minutes to talk about the value of literature hardly seems sufficient for a woman whose personal and professional life has largely been built on a belief in that value. I could hold forth on the multiple dimensions of this subject for a long time, so I'm going to have to be very selective. There are a number of dimensions this theme I'm not going to talk about, mental health, interdisciplinarity, creative writing, employability, all of those are important. But I'm going to focus on the way in which literature allows an imaginative and intellectual entry into other people's lives, other people's values, other people's ideas. This opportunity, if it is taken, does not in itself make you a better person. As many of us here will confirm from sobering observation, sophisticated readers with decades of experience 
of a huge range of literary texts can be quite as foolish or as self-interested as anyone else, if not more so. But literature, the literature of the past, literature produced within different national cultures, contemporary literature, literature in translation, literature does give you access to a range <coughs> of human experience with an intensity, which in my view is unique among cultural forms. Music may rival this capacity, but music necessarily lacks some aspects of the intimacy and challenge to our understanding of human experience that literary texts represent. Of course, theater, film, television, radio, all share in this imaginative dynamic, uh, but they operate differently and with different strengths. They are, by definition, um, grounded um, in a collective and social endeavor. Many creative intelligences must participate in making a television program, performing a play, putting a film on screen. Now, literature, of course, now that we are no longer in an age of circulated manuscript poetry, also develop, um, depends on publishers and editors and printers to reach its audience. Literary festivals, academic seminars, public readings, those are all shared experiences. But the essential point of consumption remains that of quiet communication between the mind of the writer and the mind of the reader. That can and often does provide the means by which the parameters of our understanding can be startlingly and sometimes uncomfortably expanded. In my view, and this is something that we might discuss, <coughs> this dynamic need not depend on however we define the quality or the value of the literary text. It can as readily take place in what we sometimes dismissively term genre literature, detective novels, fantasy, science fiction, if that literature has been produced on the basis of intellectual and imaginative engagement. So rich and elusive language, a mastery of poetic or fictional form, a thoughtfully managed structure might make it more likely that the process of expansion that I'm talking about will occur, but they're not indispensable. What is essential is some degree of openness in the mind of the reader. If, to take one example, if you study a work like Milton's Paradise Lost, rooted as it is in a particular strand of 17th century Protestant thought, if you read that work as a committed atheist, it is very unlikely to convert you to Christian belief, but it will offer access to the nature of the religious allegiance that defined Milton's imaginative and political world with all its ambiguities and its complexities. Similarly, readers might not share the view of race reflected in Hannah Craft's The Bond Woman's narrative but the novel can give an inward insight into what being a black woman in mid 19th century America might feel like, what it felt like in Kraft's imaginative world, which is not our world, what that experience might be. And we do ourselves and our students no favors if we limit our reading to the work of those who reflect our own worldview. We need to understand, all of us need to understand that others see or have seen the world very differently. And that of course puts our own thought in a different perspective. So that's the aspect of the value of literature that I want to single out this afternoon. It's in my view really extraordinary value as a means of entering lives other than our own, extending our understanding of those other lives, 
sometimes those alien lives and extending our understanding of our own lives through that abundant diversity. Thank you, Thank Diana. You. And Isabel. Yes, um, I endorse everything that Dinah says, particularly her uh, reading of otherness, which is, I think, very important to our subject. What I have to say is slightly eccentric to what uh, she says. Um, I ask myself the question, why teach and study literature at an advanced level in the university? Why introduce literature to a child the very moment it reaches primary school and throughout school life, plying children with stories and poems? Now, one answer we are given is that the study of literature at a high level generates workforce skills. An English graduate, it is said, fulfills eight out of the 10 skills listed by the World Economic Forum, required of today's digitally and globally sophisticated workforce. <coughs> I understand this economic alibi, but it is not so much wrong as irrelevant. Any good degree course actually produces these skills. And the WF's assumptions arise ultimately from a limited model of knowledge as that which can be turned into a skill. At its most extreme, knowledge is that which can be input at a computer terminal and received at another. So a skill is simply a byproduct of what we do. So what do we do then? I think that uh, literature is a culture's way of thinking about itself, a culture's way of thinking and feeling, imagining, reimagining itself. No AI system can originate this cultural dialogue. So from this cultural dialogue arise two conditions I'll call them civic creativity and civic questioning. So first of all, I want to make four points about civic creativity. Whether you're reading Beowulf or listening to rap, you are collaborating with and actively participating in this reflex, reflective and reflexive experience of cultural dialogue you have access to a massive resource, a massive archive that stretches back into history and to texts that are constantly remaking a dialogue with their culture. All these texts presuppose that you are actively in dialogue with them. Second, when you read, you are never alone, never solipsist, because another's feeling, thought, and language has entered your experience, your mind, and even perhaps your body. It's an innately social experience. Three, moreover, this act of collaboration that is reading is not complete until it has been mediated, shared in discussion with others. That is absolutely predicated on everything I say. The work of literature presupposes that it is innately discussable. And a collective effort by a community of readers to interpret, to imagine, to feel, to theorize, to share, is what characterizes our experience of literature and why I call this civic creativity. John Dewey believed a work of art was not fully a work of art until the experience of the recipient created it. He also believed that art was the ground of social change. I'm not so sure about this, but it's interesting to me that back in the last century, an uh, indication of the quickness of the social insight of English studies, we were already thinking about colonial issues. At all events, this shared civic creativity is a strenuous experience, but also, and finally, it is also deeply pleasurable. <laughs> 
pleasure that is central mm. of the fully human experience. It's central to civic creativity and to community and individual health. Just a little note about this. Kant saw that aesthetic experience demands the continual opening up of discussion, which is why he denied it the closure of purely intellectual resolution. Many among us characterize this openness as empathy. And I think that is an absolutely central, important aspect of what we do. But I want to go a little further than this and claim that it's also a communal intellectual and analytical act. And ultimately it's about democracy. Civic questioning. I'm going to be much shorter here. Uh, reading literature imposes responsibilities upon us. The work of literature constantly remakes our language. Whether you are reading George Eliot or Amanetta Fauna, Dickens or Caleb Atzuma Nelson, alertness to language and its expressive and analytical resources is a constant. We train and foster this demanding alertness. Thus, a questioning of the language around us in our culture, in our community, is a necessity. Today, it's imperative to question the language around us. Joan Salter, a Holocaust survivor, recently challenged the Home Secretary about her inflammatory language concerning migrants. We should be brave enough to do the same because I think our subject imposes this responsibility upon us. We have to ask, for instance, what is meant by British values? What is intended by the term woke? Neo-fascist handling of language frequently resorts to the trick of fiduciary content, words that choke discussion rather than opening it up. We should be brave enough to challenge this way of using language. Governments know what Salter called the terrible power of language and exploit it. Our deep creative understanding of language should enable us to be brave. That's what civic questioning is. And now, Susan, will you appear on the screen? Susan Alderkin. <clears throat> and if you're having trouble with your technicals, Susan, can you hear us? Uh, Perhaps it's possible to send a, a message to Susan in the chat and we could go to John Shadge. Susan in the participants. I can see a Susan reading a Susan box at the moment. Hmm. The Susan we're looking for at the moment. Um, okay, well, shall we go to John Shad next in that case? And I will send Susan Elton a, a message. Okay. Thank you. You can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, in 1924, Andre Breton writes that literature is one of the saddest roads to everything. Literary study, we may be tempted to say, is the everything discipline, the sovereign subject, or as was first said of theology, the queen of the sciences. An outrageous claim? Perhaps. But we have been there before, witness the 1930s, when literature under Levis was the road to life, life itself. Or again, witness the hour of deconstruction, when Derrida could write that the space of literature allows one in principle to say everything. Literature then it is everything. Or rather, to return to Breton, it is the road to everything. But why a sad road? Well, 
for those of us called literary critics, the road of literature is a sad road because criticism is necessarily sadness. <coughs> criticism is sad because it is not creative. Hugh Arnold, who in 1864 argues that criticism secretly hopes to reach the promised land of creative activity, but never does so. Like Moses, we critics must fall just short of Canaan. That promised land, writes Arnold, it will not be ours to enter, and we shall die in the wilderness. But to fall short of the creative, to die in the critical wilderness, may in fact be the properly human thing to do. And this is because truly creative activity must always be beyond us, all of us, whether called critics or writers, for only God, thank God, can create. And all this may well mean that literature must itself also die in the wilderness. After all, the road to everything is surely an impossible road, a path that vanishes, that, as Breton suggests, ends in tears. Literature, it fails, it dies. Indeed, in its failing and its dying, its always dying falls, literature serves to throw a very particular light on everything. This is the light of dying or death, which is, alas, no mythical everything, but a humble something, a something that is nevertheless palpably greater than us. The value of literature may then be to just toward a greater than us that is not Breton's impossible everything, but a very real something. And this something may not be simply death. It may be far harder to name. Hugh Malachme, who writes of what he writes. Why do I get the feeling I've come across a vaster subject. We note that Malarmé talks not of an object, but a subject, as if to say that what he comes across in writing is not just something, but also someone. Q. Wittgenstein. Meaning is like going up to someone. And if so, if literary meaning does entail a kind of someone, then literature must in some sense be conscious. Hugh Badieu and his question, what does the poem think? In short, literature thinks, it knows, knows things. And it may even know things that we do not or at least not yet, or not anymore. Hugh Walter Benjamin, who claims that as a human race, our very first book was a cloudless night sky. We learnt to read, he says, by reading the stars. Stars that were thought to be clairvoyant, to know beyond the normative laws of knowledge. And therefore, now that we read not the stars, but words, it is, says Benjamin, to script that clairvoyance has yielded its powers. And if, as Malarmé senses, literature entails some kind of subject or someone, then literature's powers to know may extend not just to knowledge of the world, 
but also of myself. Literature, it may know me. Hugh Derrida. Imagine at the end of reading something that one of the voices of the book murmurs, I was thinking of you. Thank you very much. Susan, are you okay to go next? Susan, you're just on mute, if you could unmute for us. Sorry to throw you in at the deep end there. Yeah, no worries at all. Very glad to be here. Um, uh, I missed the beginning of that, but caught the end, and I'm very um, uh, touched by what was was just said. And um, I have been invited here today in my guise as a bibliotherapist to explore the therapeutic, um, whether the therapeutic value of fiction has a place within the academy. Um, so I've been I've been working as a self-appointed bibliotherapist for some 15 years, um, we set up, my colleague and I set up what I believe is the world's first um, official bibliotherapy service at the School of Life in London. Um, and um, in some ways, I've been experiencing um, internally um, the very conflict we're, we're here to look at today, because as well as a bibliotherapist, I'm also a novelist, and that identity <coughs> predates the bibliotherapy for quite some time. Um, and I also teach creative writing to adults. Um, and although the novel writing and the creative writing tuition sit very comfortably together, one feeds into the other very nicely, um, I've often felt a slight discomfort with um, the bibliotherapist side of my career um, sitting alongside this. I would never um, encourage any of my writing students to embark on a novel for the purpose of trying to cheer somebody up. Um, and I myself, of course, would never um, write a novel um, trying to affect somebody's state of mind. Um, it simply doesn't sit well with the, the whole process of writing a novel to, to want to have um, that sort of effect or, or a particular um, effect. Um, one, doesn't, um, one doesn't buy um, a book as one pays for a therapist with the idea of coming away with a particular outcome. Um, so I would like to sort of start by saying literature isn't therapy. It's many things, but it's not itself therapy. I think it's undeniable nevertheless that fiction uh, literature, of course, has a profound effect on us um, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, and science is increasingly interested in that effect. And I would like to sort of define that effect in a way by, as a spectrum and the physical effect being, being at sort of one end where um, the very act of reading has a quietening effect on the mind, which is now scientifically backed up. Um, it's a little bit akin to meditation. It lowers our blood pressure. It reduces stress in measurable ways, much more effectively apparently than going for a walk or having a cup of tea, certainly more effective, effectively than video games. Um, and of course, at the other end of the spectrum, we get the full on um, potentially um, life-changing effects of a book which has transported us physically, uh, sensually to another time, another place across geography, across time, um, and in that moment, we are essentially shut down in a way to um, the room that we're in. We don't notice the noise of the, of the train that we're sitting in. We are sensually alert to the sensual experiences of the point of view character of the book that we're reading. Um, and that, again, neuroscientists have a lot to say about that these days. It's not dissimilar, apparently, to having the experience ourselves. There's, there's a whole phrase for this, which is called experience taking. So people have been proven in various scientific studies to come away changed from a reading experience, much as if they had lived it themselves. So science is um, researching these effects. I think now everybody can agree about that. 
I would like to propose that we as uh, English literature people should be and can be researching them too from our side of the equation. Um, but there's another reason too, which I think possibly, probably everybody in this room um, <coughs> was brought to read now to the academic study of literature by the effect of reading on the self. Um, so if, uh, if we were to say, okay, if I can rephrase the question that Eliane gave me, to explore not necessarily the therapeutic value of literature, but the effect of reading on the self. Can I, can I do that? Um, in a way, that's the thing that started for all of us, our relationship with books, isn't it? I mean, those big transportational experiences that we all had as children. For me, the ones that stick out are The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I came back from that book, a completely different person. Uh, the Hobbit, I mean, I could name hundreds, I'm sure all of you could as well. These are the things which brought us to the study of literature. It certainly is what made me want to study at university. It made me want to be a novelist. And uh, it made me want to start the bibliotherapy service as well, because I wanted other people to have the experience that I had and have had and continue to have. I wanted other people to know what it was like to be transported in that way, to feel that you've... Um, had your lives enriched and in a way have been able to live more lives than the one that, that, that you are living. Um, so I started the bibliotherapist, uh, bibliotherapy service in a way um, to get people reading again. At, at the time I set it up in 2008, which I did with my um, friend and colleague, Alibertu, we felt that reading of uh, the reading of literature was under some threat from the huge popularity of the self-help book movement which if you remember sort of started to rear its head in the 1990s it seemed to us um, that the people who were reaching for these books didn't necessarily need to they could be reaching for anything from the last 2000 years of quality literature um, to address the same issues we we particularly remembered, um, do you remember that book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, um, which was a huge hit in the 1990s? Um, seemed to me that you could explore this whole subject of feeling the fear and do it, doing it anyway by reading To Kill a Mockingbird um, in a way that would actually give you the experience um, of feeling the fear. Do you remember when Atticus Finch goes out into the street with his gun to shoot the rabid dog? that's coming down the street where his kids are playing. He's terrified. He hasn't shot a gun in a while. He's an old man of 40 something. Can't remember exactly what he was, but I remember he was 40 something and an old man. His hand is shaking and he has one chance to, to, to stop that dog in its tracks and he does. And that of course ends up being a microcosm for a much greater um, bravery required to stand up alone um, in defense of a black man who's been accused of raping a white woman even though the whole county is baying for his blood and his children are in the firing line of their hatred. That to me is, um, gives one a lived experience of feeling the fear and doing it anyway, which goes on to resonate through years. I've read it three times in my life and each time I find more in it. And when I think back now to the Susan Jeffers, I think that was the author of Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. I don't remember anything about reading that book except for the title. Um, just that one message, uh, but To Kill a Mockingbird um, lives with me and um, resonates in my life um, uh, hugely. So if in 2008 fiction was under threat from the popularity of self-help books, I think that now in 2023 fiction again is under threat. This time it's not other books, it's probably mostly um, the screens that that um, uh, so compellingly lure our attention. I think for children, this has probably been behind the reduction in reading that we that we've that we've all seen anecdotally, and which I understand to be the case. Um, kids these days don't seem to be reading as voraciously as those of us did, who grew up in the seventies and the in the in the pre phone era. Um, 
Also, I think there's some input maybe from, from schools in this problem in encouraging kids to analyze before actually enjoying uh, books. I, I read a, um, a, an interesting piece in The Atlantic recently about To Kill a Mockingbird, actually, and children d- were not even allowed, given the time, to finish the book before they were analyzing it. All the time was spent on analyzing certain passages. So they never got the kick of, uh, of the story at all. So where's the joy in reading in that? Um, you know, Shakespeare was very nearly killed off for me and presumably many, many people by analyzing before learning to enjoy and just, you know, having that transporting experience. Um, So, um, yeah, but for adults too, I think there's a sustained, um, that the practice of reading is now potentially harder with the destruction of our phones. There's a, um, a sense that slow reading, as is defined by um, the neuroscientist Marianne Wolfe in her wonderful book, Reader Come Home, is something that even those of us who are trained in the art of reading and love it to death and wouldn't want our lives to be without it, even we can struggle with. And she, in that book, writes very interestingly for me um, about um, wanting to go back, she she decides to sort of test herself. I don't know whether anyone's familiar with this story, but she she decides to go back to a Herman Hess book that was, she was obsessed by when she was in, in her 20s um, and read many times. Uh, she's now in her 50s. She decides to reread it. She reads a few pages, finds it unbearably long-winded, puts it down, almost gives up, then realizes what's going on and has to force herself to read it for 20 minutes a day for three weeks before she um, actually gets into it, at which point she reads it to the end, loves it so much, has that amazing experience, goes back to the beginning, wants to start again. But, you know, she had to train herself to sit with it for three weeks before she could get into it. So there's there's a, there's a loss of sustained focus in there, which um, I think we might all be susceptible to. So um, fiction... Uh, is not therapy, but I'm very glad that it has a um, the emotional um, effects of it. I'm very glad for the transportation uh, experiences that I've had. Um, I do think that um, it's worth exploring what it is that we love about books. I do think that we also need to perhaps be careful about the language that we use when exploring the effect on the self and that may may be to help my case to not use the word um, therapy. Um, I was involved two summers ago in helping to set up the world's uh, first certificate in bibliotherapy skills um, at Exeter College and I'm very pleased that we've done it. There was a therapist involved on on the panel who had very Um, important input and I'm glad that she was there and teaching people to have the skills for listening and things like that Um, but um, uh, this is a way of bringing um, the love of books actually when we 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 train the teachers to teach not therapists but librarians booksellers um, and um, um, people who social workers and people who do work in mental health as well but people who already love books and and you know, could could help to spread the word um, um, about about the love of books. Um, I would like to say that before we talked about mental health and therapy, before these words were in such common currency as they are now, um, we talked of beauty and the soul, and we talked of books containing wisdom. I, as a novelist, um, strain towards wisdom when I'm writing. That's essentially my where my effort is placed. The the best novelists, of course, managed to get there. Um, I think as readers, as I think the last speaker was indicating, we we read in order to have a brush with with wisdom. Um, It seems to me that um, if if, um, the value of the um, personal experience of literature is about a a striving for wisdom, then Um, then that sits very happily under the same roof as academia. Thank you very much, Susan. Finally, Helen. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to try to pull together what we've been hearing because um, the, the, can we join audio? I think it's probably necessary. On the microphone, it's just sitting on the table here. Ah, can I move that towards you? Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, we're not that far. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll lean over. Sorry, we're having a techno moment. <laughs> <laughs> a technical disconnection. A please signal from the from the audience if that's not audible online. Um, I'd like to try to pull together some of what you've been hearing in ways that will prepare the ground for a, a discussion to follow. Um, let me just say a couple of things, um, ground clearing, if you like, about the difference, it seems to me, between addressing the case for English and the case for literature, because it's always seemed to me important to understand what the object is in the room. If we were talking about making the case for English generally today, we would, of course, be having a much wider discussion. It would be about the learning of communication skills, about the use of the language and history of the language. It might well have a lot more to say about media, um, and it would have a great deal to say about the condition of English and the, the multilingual nature of the languages that we operate in in our culture at the moment. If you're making a case for literature, you have to deal with the artifact. And I would say having written a book on the value of humanities, that is a harder thing to do in the case of literature, because you're trying to make the case for, as Dinah put it, a higher education in something that all children in this country still have some exposure to at school, but thereafter diminishingly much exposure. So when we deal with university students, if you're talking to students in other disciplines than ours, you're, you will be aware that you're probably dealing with, for example, scientists or social scientists or even historians who have not written an essay about literature since the age of 15. So we are already specialist by the time we come in the doors. And the object of specialism that we've chosen, let's try to articulate it, is that cultural artifact or set of artifacts which involves the crafted use of language to a higher or lesser degree and where part of what we study is why it is the case that certain objects of language have tenure in the culture or are accruing tenure in the culture, what it is that's putting a pressure on that, what's allowing some of them to come to the surface. Um, I thought what I was going to want to talk today was about the importance, and I'll just say it briefly, I think it's immensely important that those two versions of what we do stay together. In other words, when we're talking about the value, the use, the significance of the literary, its place in the culture, we are also having the wider question about media, communication, multilingualism, and the painful split, I think, that's happening in the country that's often described as a split in levels of literacy. So I won't give you the figures again, I'm sure you're familiar with them, but something over 50% of the country, of the UK now, supposedly children are operating with below a level expected of an 11 year old when they deal with higher literacy. So a simple case to make for why it's worth studying English literature and putting it to the fore in the options in front of children is that literacy is by no means achieved for most children when they leave school. And what we do is to, is to craft that higher level of literacy that has to do with interpretive freedom and pleasure and the other things that people before me have been speaking about today. But I actually want to take a step back and say that I think something is, is worth talking about here, which is the extraordinary way in which we talk to each other as people who practice the disciplines of English. What you've heard today would make no sense whatsoever to anybody outside our disciplines. I don't think it would even make sense, to be honest, to a historian. So let me try to gather some of that because I think it's extremely important to the ability to explain what we do to other people. So they can each dispute the way in which I describe them. I'll do it in the tiniest fingernail way. But it seems to me that Dinah gave you a, an outward looking account of how the culture and how she herself as someone inhabiting that culture has experienced and learned to value literature, a pragmatically oriented description that anyone in the public sphere, I think, could listen to with ease. Isabel gave you something that had a lot in common with it, but had a much more uh, expressive set of political commitments, democratic commitments, and its roots were maybe more obviously that they both share the training in certain kinds of literary criticism and theory. And then John gave you something that came from an entirely different place. John, you may be the one who most wants to dispute how I characterize you, but I would say that there was a fascinating performance and a certain kind of elegiac, romantic, grieving, if you like, for the condition of criticism. It has a lot of philosophical presumptions um, based, um, based in it or you know, built into it, many of them French. It was beautifully poetic. It was a performance of a certain kind of creative criticism. And then, um, Susan, I'm sorry if I shortchange you, but I, I will just make it easy for myself by saying that you had 
something like what was once said, I think, by Mary Mothersill of Stanley Cavell, that this is criticism as confession in a way. It comes from a statement of, of your own experience and, and the commitments that experience is giving you to what literature can and can't do. Now, there is no, there's very little in the way of joined method to that. One of the things that John Guillory says and has much talked about account of the state of our profession um, came out in November, is that the method wars were always a misdescription, but we do seem to reach the point at which many of us would say that we have no method. I think you could go beyond that and say many people have been saying for a very long time, we can have no method because this discipline understands that method always builds into it presumptions about what is worth talking about and where you're speaking from. So if I reflect on that problematic, really visible in the way we're talking to each other today, it would seem to me that it's worth going back to a sentence that I know many colleagues use when they're in the classroom with students, version of the sentence, I think we can probably credit it to Auden, but I've heard other people claiming it. And that is that the question any student of English literature asks, and any teacher or scholar of English literature asks is, who is speaking to me and why are they speaking to me like this? That is, I think, fundamentally what we do. And it is absolutely worth doing as a contribution to a civic culture, as Isabel says, which needs an understanding of the plurality and variety and perverseness and you know, the odyssey, the idiosyncrasy, and sometimes the channels, you know, forcefulness of the way in which people talk to each other. It's the art of getting inside the speech, some of it historical, only able to be understood historically, some of it improvised in the moment, much of it personal, um, but also much of it just what the language does to itself by continuing to be a language and evolve. That's what we do, is we try to get inside that. The huge challenge is the one I think that Susan put in front of us briefly at the end, and that is what do we do in a culture where the media environment in which we operate is so radically different from the one in which most of us, not all of us, some of you are really young, <laughs> most of us were trained, and in which the forms of print, which most people um, now engage with, are often not actually print at all, of course, but are digital, and in which short form is taking over. Uh, if we don't have the ability to map that field and see what the interaction is between the larger like, visual data in which we're now operating as, as plural cultures, you know, globally mobile cultures, and the inherited print forms that still shape the creative culture, then I think we're abandoning an absolutely crucial part of the work we do going forward. That's a really big job to do and an exciting one and one that the students coming in the door are probably better equipped, certainly than me, to do. Thank you. Thank you. Heather. <laughs> well, thank you to all our um, speakers and, and particularly, particularly to Helen for that really useful summary and drawing out the, diff, the this um, difference of approaches to this question of value. So I'd like now to invite um, your responses to the panel questions, but also feel free to contribute your ideas to this question about defining the value of literature, but also articulating some of the problematic aspects of, of defining that um, question of value. Um, and obviously the panelists, you may have responses to each other. So I'd like to take groups of responses. Who's gonna go first? I would be interested in hearing from the panelists about how they model the value of literature to students in their teaching. Okay, thank you. And do please contribute remotely. Are you gathering questions or are you um, answering them one by one? I'm gathering. Yep. Yeah. I have a question that I can throw in there, which is, I guess, um, the idea of evaluative criticism came up in the last session on the value of criticism. Um, but um, so I suppose the status of evaluative criticism is, I guess, in the balance at the moment within the academy and also outside with the, the sort of status of the critic. And I'm interested in. Uh, this notion of what's best, and dare I say it, most beautiful, but what what's best, what's the best literature, what's valuable literature, um, 
and reconciling that with um, this idea of creativity, which on the one hand, as we've heard, has really positive um, connotations, but I think creativity also has a problematic um, aspect, particularly now in the way that it's sort of co-opted. Um, uh, there's two really interesting books on this, one just coming out by Dan Franklin about the co-option of creativity and its invention in the 1950s as sort of a tool of advertising. Another book by Ollie Mould about, uh, called Against Creativity, which is about uh, neoliberalism's um, use of creativity um, to sort of window dress um, uh, you know, sort of the market society. But, um, but I suppose also I'm thinking about the um, darker side of creativity as, um, and maybe this is just me being paranoid, but as a sort of um, an implicit attack on experts and on sort of the academic expert um, or the, the critic, who's, those who's, whose job it is to define um, literary value or aesthetic value. So how can we reconcile these two things, um, value in that sense and creativity as a more democratic um, or a, a, um, something a civic um, value? Uh, how can we reconcile those two things and, um, and also articulate, is there a case for articulating value in this age of supposed post-deference um, so that's my question. Is there another one that we can add in? There's one that's just um, popped up in the chat from Roy Livingston saying, does the description of literature extend to all fiction, including, for example, graphic novels, detective fiction, science fiction and romantic fiction? And I'm also conscious that someone online, uh, Sandra, has their hand raised. So I don't know if you want to include that as well in this round of questions. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Just to, to jump on what he was just saying about um, sort of making the value of literature um, apparent to us as literary critics, I'd be interested to hear from the panellists how they think we are going to measure the value that we have, um, that we create in literature. Because I think that related disciplines um, such as digital humanities, sort of interdisciplinary um, disciplines have become much better in recent years to um, measure and sort of like make it, um, make the value graspable that we that we create. But I was just wondering how we think English studies is going to try and do that in the future. Thank you. So responses to any of those, Dinah? Thanks. Those are, are four really interesting questions, um, and they do, I think, relate to each other. <clears throat> so I'm not really best placed to answer your question um, about teaching, because it's a while since I've been actively involved in teaching. Um, but thinking back on how I embarked on that task with my own students, and I'm sure we'd all have different answers, um, it really relates to what you were saying earlier. I think an initial point for students, for me, was always to take their own critical responses as a form of creative practice. Mm -hmm. And I think this picks up um, the challenge around the term creativity, if you like, because I take your point in time about the, the, the um, complications and hazards and challenges around that term, which is commandeered for various purposes, some of them a little bit murky. But I do nevertheless think that, and I don't think this is confined, as they say, to literary study, but, but certainly <coughs> very prominently interesting, that students should, within the disciplines that we can give them as teachers, see their work as students as a way of exercising the creative mind and finding new ways of exercising that mind in an active engagement with a whole range of, of literary texts. Of course, I mean, I know from my own recent experience of ref, a dreaded word, you know, that how um, um, creative criticism has become in itself a, a, a phenomenon in the academic world, but it isn't actually a new phenomenon. When I think back on my own interests in Victorian literature, um, writers like Walter Pater or John Ruskin, or indeed Matthew Arnold, were producing an extraordinary range of creative criticism that engaged with the world and <coughs> viewed as in 
in <coughs> and challenging ways. Um, as um, I'll, I'll be brief, just engaging with the whole question of you know, the value of different literary forms. I touched on this um, very briefly in my own talk, but I am skeptical of our hierarchy, if you like, of value in literary yeah. form. The, the notion that, that some, as it were, um, varieties of literary practice are in themselves worthy, more than um, others. I've always been alongside an enthusiastic poetry reader, a fan of science fiction, for instance, and how many great readers um, and writers, because they're often the same category actually, do engage with science fiction. Detective fiction, crime fiction, the Gothic in all its multifarious forms. Um, it, it's not a kind of ladder of value. We need to be very <coughs> careful about that, because one of the many challenges we have is the notion that somehow reading certain kinds of literature gives you an advantage in terms of social class, to put it bluntly, that if you if you refer to science fiction, you're somehow a lower order of being than if you refer to science fiction. You take my point. So I think that's something to be very careful of as we move forward. I mean, lots of other points to be made, but I'll hand over to other members of the panel. Um, yeah, I... Uh... <coughs> Just to start with students, um, I always remember when I think about students uh, of an episode that wasn't about literature at all, um, but uh, it was in the uh, uh, in Baltimore, in the place where they have fish. I forget what it's called now. And it's a very spectacular um, experience. And um, we were looking at these amazing tropical fish. And suddenly, a young man turned round to this room full of strangers and said, they're fantastic, they're so beautiful, aren't they beautiful? And he elicited various kind of responses, some of them embarrassment, some of them um, assent, and so on. And I think what I, what I learned about that is that um, he was a young person, that, that students do have passionate understanding of, of what they experience and read. Uh, it may not be always what we read, but they do. And I think you, one always has to start with that um, understanding of the student as uh, an autonomous thinker who understands beauty analysis and the the, 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 the task of the teacher is really to uh, enable that um, th these gifts uh, to, to, uh, to develop and, and to be shared. And I do think that um, collaborative discussion, which is where our, our, our subject really uh, is important. Um, I don't think anybody teaches without having some kind of a discussion. I think collaborative discussion where in the classroom there are no power relations, where the teacher is equal before the text with the student, I think that is the, the best way of releasing students' possibilities and, uh, for me, certainly, the most creative way of, of teaching. Um, the questions, the other questions were uh, really about... Um, how, how in, the, in, 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 the, in the context of uh, a culture which is increasingly sidelining us, <laughs> um, I think uh, actually in, in a, in a sidelining us, but in a, in a kind of way that actually uh, doesn't really understand uh, that we are still actually rather important. Um, I think that... <laughs> There are, there are two ways of, of trying to think about uh, the case for English. Um, Helen made a distinction between literature and English and um, talked eloquently about literacy. Um, and I, I think this is really very important. But there are two ways of, of 
thinking about English. One is that we can simply ignore the hostile sounds that we hear and go on. We can affirm what we want to affirm about beauty, about the depths of our critical understanding, about the importance of our shared debate. Uh, the other way, and I think the two things have actually have to be done together, is absolutely to go on the offensive uh, to these people, uh, and very many of them in government, who do not think that we matter at all. Um, I'm just finished um, a, a, an interesting project that the British Academy has uh, engaged with called The Deep Dive into English Studies. It hasn't been published yet, yet and I can't say anything about it because it, until it's published, we are asked to be confidential about it. But what I can say, I think, is the deep sense everybody involved in that project had is that the, the government need to be told something. And possibly the government need to be told something that they can understand in their own terms. Um, I think the most difficult thing about approaching Philistine and skeptical accounts of our subject is actually the, 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 the work of explanation uh, that has to be done. It's, it's very difficult, but I, I do think it's absolutely necessary. I don't think we should ignore it because I think we ignore it at our peril. Okay. Would you like me to move through the questions or would you like to? Sure, okay. yeah, or, or respond to the other, another panelist or as you, as you wish. Sure, um, I mean, I think just to say, to go back to your question, which I took to a practical question partly about how do we do it in the mm. classroom. I think texts earn their ways in different, by different routes to a classroom. And actually there is a quality bar because the, the most of us, I think, would hesitate to put something in front of students, you know, to put them to the trouble of reading it if they didn't think there was something in it that merited discussion. And there tends to be an aesthetic or a technical element to that. So you will have a way, if you want to study, for example, I don't know, the representation or the workings of fantasy, science fiction, whatever it is, you're going to try to find a text that merits the time spent on it. And you won't, you won't teach it more than once if it doesn't, because there's just not enough to talk about that rises above the, the basic level of its content, your explanation of its contents. Take your own examples, but some of the work will be in that room because it illustrates the development of an aesthetic tradition or a, you know, a particular rhetorical pose or a dramatic um, a way of handling dramatic materials or whatever it is. Others will be there because the propositional content drives it. You know, what, what do they have in common? Why do we want to study, for example, the idea of the future in a, in a bunch of texts, which may be very, very different in kind. So I think that sometimes diversity is going to trump the plurality because you want to hear voices or experiences represented, which won't otherwise be in the room. But over the, over the whole of the degree or the whole of the course, there's huge room for, for mucking the quality up. And the simplest thing to say about value is that it's an argument, not an absolute. It's an ongoing argument and it must evolve with the culture, not least because part of what we do is track the very difficult process of keeping texts alive. I'm hugely struck in the course of my own lifetime that work that seemed completely available to me as a teenager, like Jane Eyre, for example, now seems really quite remote to my fairly literate 15 year old. Um, and she does read, but you know, that, that text just doesn't speak to her as it, as it did to me. It utterly throws me that A Christmas Carol is seen to be the text by which to introduce GCSE children to Dickens. I mean, of all the rhetorical, you know, alien pieces of performance, you know, if you teach it well, fantastic, but giving a grip on where these voices are coming from, and what is the actual <laughs> thought, it's, it's very beautiful. Can I move to the one about how we talk to other disciplines? Because I think that's a hugely challenging one for us because that there, I've been hugely struck again <laughs> by the move in recent years by people in other fields, especially social sciences and to a degree sciences and medical sciences to understand their relation to English literature as a relation through narrative. So what they think we do is we understand stories and the telling of stories and we have a kind of critical expertise. They don't know what it is. They really probe it. It doesn't go very deep. And that's where it seems to me we have real work to do is to maybe jettison some of the technicality that we would use to talk to each other, but to learn to have that discussion in ways where there really is an addition 
because we're able to talk about, for example, perspective or the, the tensions within a narrative account or where that account is coming from. Again, who is speaking to me and why are they speaking to me like this? So that the contribution doesn't get reduced to we tell stories, but becomes something where there is expertise added to it. If there aren't very many situations, but we're getting better at, at finding where the contribution to a large interdisciplinary conversation is best rooted through literary representation. And I think that just is something we need to acknowledge and then figure out, well, where is that contribution needed? For example, I'm interested in care of the old at the moment. It seems to me that literature is a hugely valuable resource because much of the very difficult thinking about what the experience is of requiring care, being cared for across generations, the, the, the competing strains on, on lives, is finding representation in literature when it's not finding representation in the economic debate or where the, the news representation, the journalistic representation is so dark very often. It's really a version of the, you know, the imprisoning narratives of the 19th century. So, yeah. Thank you. John? Or Susan, who wants to go first? Well, oh, Susan, do you want to go? Go ahead, John, I'll follow. Okay, I've just got one kind of small thing, I guess. Yeah, I suppose um, <clears throat> for me, um, is in a sense, countering Susan in a sense, for me, uh, as a sixth former, I did, the first point at which I actually enjoyed literature, if you like, is at the point of criticism, I wasn't a natural reader. And for me, it was just the fussing, the faffing around endlessly with, with words and uh, th th that critical close reading, as we would call it, was for me the magic and remains, I think, the magic. Um, and there is that lovely phrase from Benjamin himself, magical criticism. Um, and it seems to me that one thing that we keep in the room, obviously, is that when we talk about the value of literature, we are, to some extent, talking about the value of, of criticism. And that's very, very strange activity that we do not yet and never will understand, I suppose. So there are, that's my uh, address is one or two of the questions. In, a, in one way or other. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't teach literature within a university. Um, so I, I, my contribution is gonna be a bit left field, I guess, but my, um, I'm interested in this cross, this interdisciplinary aspect of the study of, of literature, because I guess in a way that's sort of what I verge into. Um, and I'm reminded of, the piece that Ian McEwan wrote in The Guardian after 9-11 when he said that if the hijackers had been able to put themselves in the shoes of the people in the plane, um, whether they would have been able to proceed. And he was talking about the power of reading to, um, uh, to build our, our capacity for empathy. Um, and I feel very aware of um, of, of this sort of effect in the groups of people I work with, um, the way that books, reading the same books as each other can give us that space to have the same experience as each other. So many books are published these days that it's quite hard to have that same experience at the same time now. We're not all reading the same canon. Um, and the more, uh, when I've done bibliotherapy in groups, um, like, you know, within families, I've done that as part of an outreach program, working with um, parents who don't read very much and children who do read <coughs> a lot and the other way around. Um, when they can meet over a book and the enjoyment of a book, reading it together, that can be really incredible, incredibly powerful as a way to get people reading and to get people realising the... the experience they can be having. Um, and also I've read quite a lot about the, um, the sort of uh, mental health benefits of reading aloud in groups that the um, reading agency has studied. Um, groups of uh, women in prisons, for instance, groups of people with depression, sharing a text together, reading it aloud together um, can be extremely powerful as a, as a way of, um, having that experience together. So um, yeah, modeling it in, in, in life, in my own small way, I feel like 
Um, I see in my creative writing workshops every week the cathartic um, benefit of, of memory, um, which I think is very similar to hearing a story. Um, and uh, yeah, the it's all it's all muddled in together for me. It's all really muddled in together. And so yeah, I'd be interested in hearing more about the overlap with other with psycho with disciplines of psychology and therapy, I suppose, within academia. We've had um, two comments or questions in the chat, one of which I think Helen's already answered. I'll just read the other one out and then I know that Nicholas and Ronan both have a hand up. Um, but Michael Amherst asks, I'd like to ask what you all see as the role of creative writing and creative critical courses in the future of the subject, particularly given Isabel's point about rejecting ref's definition of knowledge in economic terms, and given discussions in the previous session that the purpose of graduate study should make a new contribution to knowledge is really more directed to the sciences. Um, and Michael says, I also want to note that the fine art and music undergraduate courses have a history of combining both the creative and the academic. Um, Lennon, perhaps first. I think Nicholas had his hand up first, so I think you should let him go first because he was more. <laughs> he was definitely more assiduous. Go for it, Nicholas. Uh, oh, okay, Thank, thanks, Ronan. Um, so I was interested in how, looking back over the talks, there in some ways there are two notes that came up a couple of times. Uh, one, working backwards, uh, Helen, that wonderful phrase you gave us about. Uh, who is speaking to me and why are they speaking to me this way? I mean, that would seem to be about trying to identify sort of critically um, how a particular text is situated, where it's speaking from. But then the other thread that I'm wondering if it's sort of like, in some ways, mutually exclusive, is uh, the theme of coming to literature to somehow take on a different perspective. So not so much view it from a distance, but to actually inhabit it and see what happens there. So I'm not saying that they're mutually exclusive in like a in like a bad way. It's just that it might be kind of like a gestalt, like duck rabbit thing, like either you're doing one or the other at any particular time. And I'm wondering if that maps on to a different, less explicit um, thread that I think is running through the conversation, which is the question of if the artifact in the room that we're dealing with is writing, or if it's some subset of writing, meaning like, you know, novels, poetry, imaginative uh, work. Because if it's writing, then, of course, the the sort of identifying who's speaking and why are they speaking to me this way, that's where it sort of launches into having some of the democratic payoff that I think we like to understand it to have. Um, whereas the sort of experiential taking on a perspective thing seems to work better for the kinds of writing that is understood as in literature in the more circumscribed sense. So I'm kind of wondering about just how the panel thinks about those two trends. And if I'm right in thinking that maybe each of those trends maps onto a particular notion of what the object is. And, and it would be interesting even to think about how each of those, uh, each of those threads might lend itself to criteria to pick up Eliane's provocation to try to think about what the criteria are for sort of evaluating might give us criteria for uh, selection, but that they might not be the same, um, depending on which sort of angle we're taking. Thanks. Thank you, and my name? Uh, yeah, thanks. My my common question is actually resonates really well with that. And it's um, it, it, it also picks up with some of the comments Helen made, particularly that definition, uh, who's speaking and why are they speaking to me? And the word literature, and I know, and I don't want to reopen questions of definition and what it is we're talking about, uh, because we, we're very used to those questions about the, the difficulty of defining literature. I'm more interested in in, in addressing the question of um, definition in terms of disciplinary genealogy, uh, because it seems to me that question, who is speaking, why are they speaking to me, is a question which could be asked or could be very, very germane to other disciplines as well as English. I mean, it, it is germane to English, but it could also be asked in, in media studies and, and communication and a lot of those post-disciplines. So I'm thinking about what is it just to bring the case for English 
and the value of literature, which I agree are very different questions and actually could easily be in opposition to one another. It seems to me you could easily argue that um, the value of literature is undermined by the presence of English, either, either understood in its institutional form within the university or criticism generally. We're very familiar with that idea that that criticism is in some way. I mean, I think we even had some comments, Susan's comments about, which I, I was very sympathetic to, about students learning how to analyze and how that affected their appreciation of literature picks in to that tradition whereby oh, we're, we're kind of killing it, we're, 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 we're killing literature by teaching it. That old idea, which I'm not going to reproduce, but I'm just, just trying to highlight the, the distinction between the two. And another thing that came up in the last session is, is that idea of the word liter literature is something which in our discipline has kind of come back in, having been out for a long time. When I was an undergraduate, literature was regarded with a great deal of skepticism, and a lot of us want a lot of people wanted to get rid of it. Um, there's a because it, it, it smacked of elitism and um, you know uh, suspect ideological hierarchies creeping around in it. Uh, uh, but but it has now, I think, come back in. There's a new hospitality to it. Sometimes now it's understood much more as an event rather than an object, the act of reading and engagement. Uh, and I'm wondering if 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 it's re if it's presence within English or if it's resurfacing with English, as if perhaps a way of England, English to re reaffirm its boundaries rather than to break behind it. Uh, it, it how the panelists feel about, about that, about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And finally, and this is just kind of a slightly separate question, though I think it's all separate, Something else which came up in the last session, uh, which no one has, has, has addressed today, is the relationship on how we might vary uh, uh, our language in defending um, uh, pedagogy versus research. It seems to me that in our discipline, um, there is a split between the way we teach and the way we research, which is actually a sign of the malaise of a discipline. And a lot of what we were talking about, a lot of the value of literature that was put forward today is the sort of literature that happens in the classroom, the sort of la the language of empathy or enchantment or uh, otherness. And it doesn't always migrate to the sort of research that generally gets done, which is still pretty historicist, I think. Uh, and I don't know if you have any comments about that. So I rather rambling it's very late over here I'm, I'm in melbourne but the um the two questions the uh, the stakes of literary literature how it's kind of coming into english and going out of it and whether there's any value in having a, a kind of disciplinary uh, discrete uh, discreteness and identity and the issue of teaching and research thank you ronan and um, i'm aware of the time but this is are there any other burning questions or comments a lot. There's a lot to respond to. Claire. I know we're running out and I don't want to have the last word, but I do want to just go back to John Shad's piece because I think that that has haunted and or hovered over the whole conversation without actually being brought into the conversation. Um, and I, I don't think we can do that here, but I do take away with from the from from the whole discussion. Um, a kind of haunting about reading the stars. Um, and I, that captured something about the expressive possibilities. I think we can bring it in because it okay. gives us such a crystalline example of yes. what the difference is between asking the question, who is speaking yeah. to me? Yeah. And, and why are they speaking to me like this? Because he gave us a, a really, a beautifully poetic example of someone speaking to you in a way you do not expect them to speak, in exactly. like, even in a venue like this dedicated to English and its plurality of methods. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how many of the questions this will answer, but it seems to me, I think most of us get squeamish, even you know when speaking to the subject, when asked to speak to the subject, Susan voiced her squeamishness with, uh, with um, shrinking down the question of why they speak to me like this with their expression of their perspective and what we do in English is to take the vehicle of language as a whole and to ask those questions about the why is it like this is what genre is it inhabiting what moment in the history of the language what what geography is it speaking from what 
you know, what educational equipment or what, you know, what range of, of technical apparatus does it have at its disposal? And what is it doing with the whole of it? So it's not a question, and, and I guess you're hearing pretty loudly push back against a very narrow identity politics version of what our subject can do, because it is so much larger than that. And, and it's, it, it's, you know, it's a tool and the equipment of when things go wrong around cultural reduction um, to that job. So um, to take up the question of how, how the text is situated that, that Meg gave us, I, I, sometimes I think we, we don't row back and I would never want to row back. I think English was profoundly changed by the cultural studies and the media studies developments that came out of it. And then many of our departments still sit within it. That's absolutely right. And I think what happens when literature, yes, it does rather go out of many departments right, and then it comes back in. But I think that's partly because the, refraction of the skill sets around those other angles becomes sharper. It's really just it's the process of specialization within our departments. And what I think is a great strength of our departments is that so many of them, or certainly our subject as a whole, still contains all of them. And when it's doing its job well, they're speaking to each other. So you're able to answer that question, yeah. what is the whole range of the uses of language in, in the culture? What, what is the use and theory of the English language some departments still Absolutely. avoid? That's part of what we do. Yeah. But we also ask that specialized question, yeah. and it may just be part of the degree that students choose yeah. language and literature, or it may be the whole, what is the specificity of this artifact? How much of how we define it has to do with perceived value? How much of it does it have to do with inherited genres or techniques or whatever? How much of it is just a decision by somebody in a position of power or a group in a position of power to put an institutional frame around it? That's the job we do, is to have that discussion and try to figure out how we got there. And that's, that, okay. in that sense, um, takes us back to the relation between creative criticism um, and creative yeah. writing, which came up to a really important point. Seems to me increasingly looking to the future of English, they hold hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. The, the barriers yeah. that used to exist um, between those modes of yeah. reading, yeah. modes of writing are dissolving, and I think in a very positive way. So I think. I think that, that creative writing, just to pick that up, we haven't said much about creative writing, it's often now central to the work of departments, academic departments of English, colleges, universities, you know, does involve creative criticism. It has to. If you are going to write, you need to learn to read. And I think that mm -hmm. that is at the heart of what we're talking about. And it also takes us back to, I think, um, Isabel's really important points about the political force of the value mm -hmm. of literature. Because if you are learning to read, mm -hmm. your reading isn't limited to whatever we think of as mm -hmm. criticism, um, as literary criticism, or indeed as literature, always going to be slippery terms. But we all read all the time. And if we learn to read, we will learn to, as it were, read alertly and in informed ways about um, subjects, um, political issues, contentious issues, where we need that openness. And mm -hmm. frankly, we need that training, what you talked about as skills. That's, I think, really important. That doesn't preclude economic value. And just one final point, you'll forgive me being a bit partial here, but REF, for all its faults, does not prioritise the economic value of literature. It includes it, but it does not prioritise it. And in terms of its definition, um, which is very broad, uh, what English and other humanities disciplines can offer, um, it foregrounds uh, public understanding, um, the work with communities that we've been talking about, a whole range of contributions um, to community life, to national life, and to the extension of knowledge through outputs. And REF from that point of view has been on the side of the development of the, the issues that we've been talking about. Brief, very brief concluding responses. Yes, well, I, I, I really, I want to say, uh, Two things really, and that is that um, I really believe that the foundation of everything we do, everything we've talked about, whether it's media studies or cultural studies or study of literature <laughs> research or undergraduate teaching, 
fundamentally, we are talking about language. Yeah. Absolutely, in, in its many faceted and wonderful ways. I mean, it is the most wonderful object to me. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're really talking about when we talk to students, I think. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, I actually deprecate skills. I've seen so much Philistinism and limited um, utilitarian and, and uh, frankly, um, utterly narrow reading of, of what uh, a workforce should be for a start, that I, that I really deprecate skills. I want to put those aside. Um, but the other thing I don't want to forget, um, and I know I have to be brief, is that while we were talking, I remembered Wordsworth talking about a landscape, a, 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 a waterfall haunting me like a passion, haunted me like a passion. And somehow the motivation of our teaching is, is bound up with that kind of experience. Thank you. Thank you. And briefly, Susan, then John. Susan, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I've just enjoyed this immensely. It's encouraging to me that um, discussions of this kind are happening. I'm very pleased to have been there, to have been part of it, and um, just, just to have been included in the discussion is is. Um, was great. I don't have anything particularly to add to what's been said. I'm happy that um, this aspect of, of reading has been noticed um, and is there. That's all really. Thank you. Thank you. John. Um, okay, one well, bullet point for me then. At the risk of sounding gnomic. <laughs> Why not? Um, uh, no, we don't, I don't think we yet know, have any idea what literature may yet know or be able to do. Okay, <laughs> on that nicely gnomic and brief point, um, note, thank you very much to John, Susan, Isabel, Dinah and Helen and to you all for your excellent questions. The next event is on the 24th of May on the value of the material. So thank you to our panel.